Welcome everyone to New HD NYC with your host Ray K. Available on all major podcast platforms and powered by New HD Media. Now here's your host, Ray K. This is this is a special show. Um Bo Payne is my guest, and this is a story you do not want to miss. It's a recovery story. It's a success story. It's about someone that was drafted by an MLB team and who went through everything. I mean, he went through dependence on alcohol, drugs, you name it, it happened to this man. He, he stayed with it, and now he's, uh, he's uh, doing very well. We're going to talk about present, past, and what led to this and everything in between. Bo Payne, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ray. Thanks so much, man. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So. All right, good, good. Bo, you had quite a story drafted by an MLB team. You went through everything. You were in the penitentiary for five years. We're going to talk about that. Let's go back. Uh, well, let's start now. Sure. What, what are you doing right now? Let's talk about the present tense. What, what are you doing at this very second? Yeah, yeah, you you bet. Um, uh, first of all, I want to preface this by saying um, I live a pretty simple life, uh, okay. which I actually <laughs> enjoy. Not a lot of complications. I am uh, currently finishing up a degree in sports administration, sports management. Okay. So um, it's kind of like a business degree with an emphasis on uh, sports administration side. So it's taken me uh, 30 years. <laughs> I'm a 47 year old turning 48 year old college student, but I started in 92. Well, you uh, look but, you 25. Know, you're never too old you to look, give up you look on 25. Your hopes you look and dreams. Good. <laughs> you look pretty good. Whatever you do. Uh, thanks, man. I appreciate yeah. it. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing nowadays. Just uh, I do a lot of recovery, uh, a lot of fitness, a lot of working out and running. And I, I live in Boise, Idaho, which is just gorgeous. I mean, it's 60 degrees today with snow-capped foothills and uh, a beautiful river to ride. Uh, you know, ride your bike alongside and uh, nice. And just devote a lot of time to to studies and uh, and get it together, man. So yeah, things are great. No complaints. Nice, nice. So well, let's go back. Let's go back. A lot of a lot of things happen when we're young and, and, and it affects us. Not that it's an, an excuse, uh-huh. you know, you're uh, you, you know, yeah, it's your story. Tell us about the early days and, and, and your growing up years. Give us a little, uh, you know, five yeah, minutes of that. Sure. No problem. Um, so, Ray, I was born in Tennessee, okay. uh, a town called Jackson, which is probably an hour or so outside of Memphis. So I was born in Tennessee. Jackson, New Jersey. Jackson, New Jersey. Jackson, Jackson, New Jersey. Jersey. Well, there's, yeah. there's, yeah. Andrew okay. Jackson, well, there's a right? connection right there, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're a Yanks on socks, but we still got that. So, <laughs> um, and I, uh, so I guess by my first five or six years of life, we bounced around the South. Um, it wasn't because we were kind of needing things. Um, my dad is a Vietnam veteran. Okay. Um, had come back and brought a lot of, a lot of baggage with him from Vietnam. And this was obviously before I was born. I was born in 73. Um, my dad came back, went to Vanderbilt, finished school. Uh, my mother finished school at Tulane. So they're, they're educated folks. Um, both my parents have graduate degrees from these schools. I have a GED from a Idaho State Penitentiary. Um, okay, so, okay. so just to kind of give you a backstory. So okay. um, we ended up, my parents got divorced when I was four. And uh, we were living in New Orleans and uh, when I was four. So I moved to Dallas with my dad um, just you know, kind of young kid, um, just starting to play a little bit of sports here and there. Some, for some reason, and we still don't know why to this day, my mom, who's the, just a saint, we love her. Well, we love her to death. Our entire family loves her. Um, they remarried a couple of years later and we moved to Vancouver, British Columbia. They remarried to uh, each way other. Up north, again? Great white. Are they, saying they to each other. Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. 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 And this is a pattern. Yeah. This, this goes on again, <laughs> but, um, okay, okay. so we get up to Vancouver. I want to say when I'm probably six or seven and, uh, you know, as you're growing up, your dad is your, my dad is my coach of all my sports. I'm playing, you know, I soccer, baseball, football, uh, hockey in, in Canada, you know, just, um, you know, basketball, of course, you know, just like kids back then we played everything. There was no specialized travel groups or AAU or any of that, that kind of jazz back then. um, And I look back on it as the way that my life kind of unfolded throughout the years. Um, A lot of the the things that happened to me as a, as a, as a young child um, and the expectations and pressures of performing um, for my father, uh, I I understand, you know, um, because I was usually the best player on on the teams that I played on. I had some good athletic ability. Um, 
and I understand, you know, having your dad has expectations for you, but just things like, you know, I'd be seven or eight years old and I'd go four for five with two jacks, two doubles and uh, the fifth AB I'd strike out and uh, you know, I'd be taken home and have the living crap beat out of me for wow. the, for the uh -huh. strikeout. And I would be thinking at eight, eight years old, I said, well, I just hit two jacks and two doubles. I mean, <laughs> what, what gives man, <laughs> you know, and, right. and um, so you know, I'm like, wow, that you know, is. like what's going batting, on? I'm batting 800. Yeah. And, what's uh, going yeah. on? Yeah. You know? And yeah, exactly. And, and, and before I go any further, I, I don't, I, I want to make very clear that I'm, I'm, I'm not a victim in any shape or form. I don't portray myself as a victim. And this is just stuff that I've learned over the years as to what contributed to how my life kind of unfolded throughout the years. And, um, you know, Ray, I'll tell you another quick story. I was 12 years old. I guess I was uh, middle school, seventh grade, playing on the basketball team. Um, and I was a good ball player. You know, I could, you know, my sister's the head coach in Colorado, I think, as you know, so um, have athlete, athletes in our family. But I was 12 years old and I was having a, a, a cruddy first half. You know, I'd turned the ball over a couple of times. I was working on some different moves, some spin moves and, and had the balls, you know, swipe from me a couple of times. So my father, who was just such an insane maniac at halftime, takes me across the street from the gym we're playing, takes me into a bathroom, takes my head and dunks it in the men's urinal over and over and over and tells me what an embarrassment I am and how I'm embarrassing him in front of all these people in the gymnasium. And, and, and by that time, granted, there has been years of this going on now. Um, so the physical stuff, I, I just kind of got used to it. I'm like, eh, here comes another beating or whooping, but the, the, the verbal and the mental stuff really took a, a deep toll on me for many years. So real quick to finish that story, I've got blue urinal cake covered all over my orange uniform. <laughs> I've, my hair's a mess. I go back <laughs> as a 12 year old to play the second half. Um, I think I lit it up. I think I probably had 18 or 20 in the second half. And, but, you know, I still remember this day having blue stains on me from those little urinal cakes, you know, and the men stand up, yeah, right. you know, in these grungy, grungy, dingy, you know, gas station I bathroom remember. type stuff. So that wasn't a one-time thing. It, it was, was just, a, it was a common thing that, with this urinal. That was thing. not a, yeah, it wasn't. Well, that, that was a one-time thing with yeah. the urinal thing, but uh, the abuse and the, but that was not a one-off abusive thing. You know, he used to take me home from tournaments in the middle of the night and then kick me out of the car and say, you know, find your own, you know, effing way home. And I was like, I'm 11 years old and I'm 30 miles from the house and it's pitch black. <laughs> I'm out on the freeway. What do you, what do you mean? And he's, and he's calling me all these names and, and hitting me and, and uh, telling me and his thing was always like, you embarrassed me in front of all these people. And I said, well, I just had 35 points and 10 dimes, or I just went four for five with two jacks, or I, I just threw a no, you know, a little league, a six inning, no hitter with 15 K's. I'm like, nothing was ever good enough. And so the physical stuff, I, I just accepted, you know, I just was like, oh, okay, well, here comes another butt whooping. Wait, was your dad an alcoholic slapping, or was there a drinking issue or drugs? No. Or Nothing no different. drink, no drinking, no drugs, no nothing in my huh. family. Um, my sister, who's my best best friend in the world, turned out to be a saint. You know, great uh, played ba uh, basketball, St. Mary's, like I said, coaches hoops. Um, and so, as my life went on and the years went on, I uh, I slowly but surely turned to drugs and alcohol to escape reality. And um, the verbal stuff really killed me, man. It, it just it made me afraid of my own shadow, to be honest with you, up until, and I'm 47 years old now, up until really the last seven, six, seven years, I've kind of understood. And, and, you know, I walked around for a long, long, many years, Ray, with my shoulders slumped and my head down and just, just living from drink to drink and, and trying to forget about a lot of stuff. So that's how I cope. So there was post-traumatic stress all through the years, I would, I would say. Or... A lot of years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But okay. you know, I, th there comes a point in time where, you know, I'm a veteran, I'm an infantry veteran and I've got good health at the VA and uh, I've seen some good folks and, um, and uh, it's not an issue with me anymore. It doesn't, that, that kind of stuff doesn't have power over me anymore. He, he, mm -hmm. he's a non-entity in my life. Um, I've got great support people around Did me. Did he try to live through you? Bo, or... Sober almost. Yeah. Or was it more? Uh... I think he did vic vicariously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, was he abused when he was a kid it's, or was it, you know, just, he, he never well, really quite made it and you were. No. His... Yeah, that was it. And uh, he was a good football player in high school. You know, I mean, he was 
decent. He was better than decent. He was a good athlete, good track athlete. I think he ended up getting a scholarship to U of O, Oregon, actually, to, to run track, which was a huge school back then for, for track. Um, it didn't cut it, or I don't know what happened. He ended up going to Vietnam, became an army, an army officer, um, came back, but never made it. So he looked at me as this kid who had this ability and talent and ended up, you know, and all this, this different stuff. And uh, I think that that, along with his clouded judgment on a lot of other things, um, uh, led to his, his abuse okay. of me. And, okay. okay. you know, it's just not an issue anymore. But, right. Yeah. All right. So now you get into, into uh, was it drugs, alcohol, the whole thing to escape the feeling? What happens then? And tell the us that. Feeling right. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. So um, <clears throat> I started using drugs when I was 11 years old. Um, I remember uh, I was in Vancouver and uh, I had just was so emotionally shattered and broken inside and scared and fearful that uh, uh, one of my buddy's older brothers had some had some marijuana and we just started smoking it. And, and then we started drinking when I was, you know, 12, 11, 12, 13. And it was just, I could escape it, man. I would, I would go home at night and take all the whoopings and all the crap. And, and it was strange because we had money. We were kind of an upper to middle to upper class family, but so we had all this whole double life thing going on. And, uh, and it just, you know, I broke my ankle when I was young and the doctor prescribed me some pain pills and, and instantly I was just hooked on the feeling and um, the escapism as a young child and as a young teenager got to be the norm, you know, and, and I don't want to get extremely graphic, but I mean, I was shooting heroin when I was 15 years old and also trying to play baseball and, and have a career and, you know, and, and trying to keep up with, with grades and everything as well. So it just it sounds insane and there's a lot more insanity. Um, but the bottom line is that I just couldn't cope. And I did, I had no self-confidence. I was insecure. I was scared all the time. And, and the alcohol and the drugs allowed me to, to be somebody who I, who I didn't like, you know, it allowed me to escape out of my body who I didn't like who I was. From the outside world, Bo, did everything seem normal? I mean, was your dad like friendly to everybody else and everyone was a great family. Was that was over there indications that there were things or both uh it sounds see, look look pretty good to it the outside because okay. my dad was smooth and okay my, my dad was smooth and uh, had a good job and knew how to lie and okay yes and so everything looked um, good from the from the third guy the, i have no idea okay okay from the yeah there's a few that knew you know and i might like, bless my bless my mother's heart you know there's not much she could have done about things but um there's a few select people that kind of knew the stuff okay. that went on, but right. people were really afraid of, afraid of my father to say anything as well. But, but from the outside, we didn't look like the Cleavers, but we looked, we looked like a pretty, like a normal family. type family. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so now you're escaping You're you have this great talent. Um, you know, you're a baseball pitcher. I mean, were you a, like an all County type pitcher or were you, you know, I know you were drafted eventually by an MLB team. You must've been, you yeah. know, pretty good. Yeah. You know, in high school. Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. You bet. Um, so I, uh, when I was probably 12, gosh, little league, you know, I was, I was bringing it, man. You know, I always could throw hard, you know, I was throwing. Did that give you a escape? Ball? When, when I was 12 when, on the gun. When you're on the uh, field, did well, you, was that an escape too? I feel like I was robbed of the beauty of sports as a kid okay. because I was so scared okay. all the time, if, okay. that, if that makes sense, you know, because okay. I, baseball is my, my religion. I love it to death. I think it's the most beautiful sport ever, but I, but I played everything and, and I was just, you know, I was a goalie in soccer. I was a quarterback in football. I was, you know, I played shooting guard and, and basketball and, but I just feel like I was robbed of any enjoyment that I could have had as a, as a young You didn't child have the joy of the sports that you're supposed to have when you're a kid. No, I was just scared, scared to death to fail for, repercussions um but i juxtaposed the drug abuse and the alcoholism and the escapism with maintaining and uh when i was i think seven sixteen when i was a junior i moved to miami florida uh to, to play on a better ball baseball team we ended up um losing in 1990 my junior year to veritech and uh, i believe it was lake brantley florida in the state semis um and we had a great team alex gonzalez all-star for the um for the Blue Jays, Cubbies, you know, he, he was one who kicked that ground ball right after the Bartman play. Okay. <laughs> a lot right. of people remember that. He was my high school shortstop. Wow. Okay. Uh, my, my first baseman was the assistant hitting instructor for the 18 Sox who won the World Series, Andy Barquette. Uh, he's one of Cora's buddies growing up. Um, you know, myself was, was drafted. Uh, I was 
actually um, uh, had a lot of projections to go in the top five rounds out of high school. Um, but I ended up getting kicked out of high school, Ray, becoming academically ineligible, um, lost my draft status. And uh, just, uh, I didn't have the drive that a lot of guys did. And, and I had a lot of other issues that a lot of guys didn't deal with. So, um, so I lost my draft status out of high school and uh, had to go to a junior college and kind of went from there. So. Okay. Now, as you were getting older, now your dad's influence must have been subsiding, right? Because now you're bigger, you're probably bigger than yeah. him, stronger than him. I mean, is that does that come into play a little bit? Like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not 10 years old anymore. This guy doesn't have the, the strength over me, at least. I mean, got a quick, it... quick, quick little story on that. One. Okay, so, go right ahead. Uh, so when I was I, I want to say I was probably 15 or so. Um, and my, my dad's a bully. And okay. uh, like all bullies, if you stand up to bullies, they're, they're gonna is your dad still around down. now, by the way? He's around. I haven't spoken okay. with him in 15 years. Okay. I think he even lives in Europe somewhere. I'm, okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't, I don't. okay. Um, so I'm out picking weeds in the garden. And uh, I, I accidentally picked a rosebud that I thought was a, a weed or a, a flower bud or something. And, and he, and he How dare you, and right? Saw it and I could picture what's the nerve of me. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, <just> the, <laughs> the nerve of, of all the thousands of weeds that I just, which is fine, you know, raking kids, rake leaves in the garden. In the, so he comes out and, and he just says, what did you just do? You know, it makes a huge difference. I mean, makes a huge beef about how I'm destroying the garden, you know, because I picked a little rosebud. And I, you know, and I said, I'm six, four by then, um, a skinny, you know, but still, and I said, this is it. This is it, man. You're, you're done. And, uh, I said, if you ever talk to me like that again, uh, there's going to be an issue. And, uh, he forced, he, he tried to then that day and, uh, and I put him down and, okay. uh, there was no issues after that with him. Okay. And, uh, that kind of started a kind of a history of me of not taking stuff and kind of maybe going overboard and, and stuff like that. But it just kind of like all that pent up stuff for so many years. And I was, and I was like, well, the boy grew up, even though I'm 15, right. Um, I grew up fast, man. And, 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 uh, you don't have any idea what you're, what you're dealing with. If you keep doing this to me, did you feel good doing that? I mean, was it like never, a, an empowering feeling? Like I got some control here or you must have felt a little bad, probably. Felt great. I felt, felt great. great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I felt, okay. you know, I felt bad. I mean, we had this weird relationship where, you know, he would always beat me up and then buy me all the nicest things in the world to make up for it when I was a kid, you know, and, and then he would do it again. And then it just, it was just such a dysfunctional, ridiculous thing. Um, but it felt good to not have to deal with that anymore. And I kind of, it felt empowering. Okay. And uh, okay. I felt grown up, man. I felt like a man. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Right. All right. So now, now you, now you, now you go into adulthood, you know, let, let's, let's go past, I know you got drafted. It didn't work out. I mean, can these things ever work out? Like what chance did you really have going through that as a human being? Does, and can any kid get through that without, without, it seems like what you went through is just a normal thing. Isn't that just a human reaction of a kid that's scared and then you're going to escape. So you, you're going to take some drugs. Like, why would you do any other thing when you think about it? I mean, looking back on it, you know, and, and I, I do some speaking engagements at, at meetings in front of groups. Um, my biggest thing is to, to help a lot of veterans, to help a lot of folks, just, just every, average everyday men and women get sober and stay sober and understand why, how, and what to do. Um, and looking back on it, what else was I going to do? You know, just, I mean, it was right. just so horrific, you know, and, and this is, and I've given you just the pure PG version, you know, and um how, don't tell I, me about how much worse was I, it how much yeah. worse was it is this 50 percent of it or or 20 percent of it like it's a yeah, it's probably 50 percent okay. There's, okay there's some stuff that was okay. just okay. no good and, okay and like i said you know the um the, the lasting the lasting impressions negative impressions that can have have excuse me happen to a child a lot of it is verbal and mental and emotional because those are the scars that stay with you forever um the physical stuff, you know, you can, you can deal with, like I said, you know, um, but, the, but that set the tone for my timidity and, uh, insecurities and my, um, I guess my arrogance, overconfidence, you know, to, to hide a lot of the stuff that I was negative feelings about myself as I move forward as an adult. And, uh, it set the stage for some pretty bad stuff. Okay. Know? So, cause you're, um, you're, you're, you're yeah. messed up. You're kind of messed up inside to keep, to, to use a simple term, right? 
I mean, it messes absolutely, you up. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's different degrees, and 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 but when folks are broken, they're broken, and they don't have to go. And that's what I I say a lot too. I said there are a lot of yets that a lot of people don't have to experience if they you know if they can stop this. Um, but if you're broken, you're broken. You know, okay. various degrees, yes, but but still, broken is broken is broken, and it's a terrible feeling to to lose hope. Was, was there any, I want to get back to that hope in a second. Was there any um, good, was there yeah. anything that was good? Was there anything that you clung to onto a baseball? I, I know you like the Red Sox was, I mean, did that, did that help at all? Or was it like all bad? I mean, was there some good? Yeah. You know? No, no. Okay. No, okay. I, I don't want to say it was all bad at all. I okay. had good friends. So there were some good, good moments you know, within and, the childhood. And, okay. Yes. Okay. And, and I, and I, um, you know, my, like I said, my first two heroes were, were Larry Bird and, and Jim Rice. And uh, in the 80s, of course, to be a Larry Bird here or fan was was pretty rewarding. <laughs> and right. uh, and then, gosh, you know, 86 just destroyed me. I think I was 12 or, you know, and Clemens started out 14 and 0. And I still remember the game. He lost his first one against the Blue Jays. But but game six was uh, was tough. And and I stayed home from school for a few days and cried and cried and didn't understand it. But but those are the things that we do as our childhood heroes, our, our ball players and and stuff. But um. No, there was some good stuff involved. I had good friends and some good relationships with teachers, and okay. and I did have some fun times playing. Playing. I, when I say that I was completely robbed of the enjoyment of playing sports, it's not a hundred percent. I feel that I was robbed of a lot of it, um, but uh, I certainly had some good times too. Okay, you mentioned before, Bo, about hope. You said you you lost hope. Yes. Is there a point where you lose all hope? I mean, you are still alive. I mean, did you, I mean, did you try anything drastic or, I mean, was there a shimmer of hope or a little bit of hope or was it like all um, gone? I lost all hope a few times. Um, you know, I did some drastic things. Um, I was, you know, I was suicidal uh, a couple different times. I was so, um, so destitute and so hopeless. Um, standing in the middle of a mirror in front of a mirror with a nine millimeter loaded with the, which actually with the hammer cocked, uh, just begging God to give me the strength to pull the trigger. I was so done with life. I, I just couldn't go on. And by the grace of God, I'm alive. That, that's it. And not to make the show about religion or spirituality or anything like that, but I, but that's by the grace of God go I, and that's why I'm here. Um, and, and I'm certainly glad that I, I made it through because I have hope galore now <laughs> you know but well, there something are times must have prevented that, when, you from, i think yeah you know from taking that shot i mean something prevented you from doing that yes uh, absolutely and, and i think deep down inside something told me that things are going to work out if i just keep pushing keep okay, pushing okay, okay. um I, i've been in recovery since 95 on and off you know and like i said god willing my next sober birthday will be five years clean and sober and uh, I've got the world at my my fingertips now. There's nothing I can't accomplish if you know if I stay clean and sober. Um, and that's a message that I like to get out to people who have lost hope. Um, and it's not a it's a long way back. It doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I, I have a good friend. Uh, his name's Julian Davis. He wouldn't mind me talking about him. He lives in Toronto, Ontario. He's a guy I grew up with. He's 16, 17 years clean and sober now. He's kind of the guy that, you know, when you grow up, everyone said, well, he, there's no way he'll ever make it. Kid's going to do life in prison, this and that, this and that. He was just up to no good. And we were taught, we talk all the time. And he said the other day, he said, you know, about everything that you have done in your life that has happened to you in your life up to this point, this very point where you and I right now are speaking, Ray, um, God has done for me. So I'm able to help others. And so he said, everything, you know, you're, you're a product of the good and the bad, but now it's how you use it. And so this is a tapestry that has taken place in my life. Uh, I, I don't believe things happen uh, accidentally or coincidentally or serendipitously maybe, but um, I think this is all what was supposed to happen in my life. And, and I'm able to, uh, to help others now, man. And that gives me more gratitude than anything I could ever even explain to you. Was it, was it, it seems like God eventually comes into getting, getting sober. I mean, was that, yeah. Is that would that that lead you out of it? I mean, the, you know, God is uh, something spiritual. I'll call it, I'll call him God, her God. Is that was that Huge. the key? Was that the key? Okay. It's okay. it's a big it's a big it's key. Big. It's as big as okay. key as there is possible. I, I start okay. my days with spiritual readings and uh, okay. I ask God for guidance. And and when I say God, I don't advocate for anything. You know, I'm I'm I am inclusive to anything. If folks like religion, great. If they're pure spirituality, fantastic. 
whatever you believe in, you know, I had to find a power greater than myself that because I was living on my will for so long and the things that I was doing and trying to take control of my own life by my own will was not working. It was sending me to penitentiaries, homeless shelters, under bridges, um, drugs, alcohol, uh, all, all the, all the above. And so I finally had to, um, to, to just say that, that this is not what I'm doing is not working anymore. And, and I'm now I'm in my early forties and, uh, I'm still in the penitentiary and, um, this is not a life. I have two beautiful children and, and I'm capable, and this is not a life that I want to lead anymore. And I can't do this on my own. And, uh, I prayed to God, my God, uh, for help. And slowly, uh, but surely, things started to happen in now, a positive way. I want to talk about um, some of your time in prison. Is it prison or sure. penitentiary? Is it the same? I hear different terms. Oh, it's, a, it's, same a, it's the same, same thing. Jail, state prison. prison, uh, state prison. Yeah, yeah. Okay. well, well, jails, 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 county jail. Each each county has a jail, and then that's where you the misdemeanor guys go, and then the guys that are on their way to prison. Um, they have to wait a few months or whatever until the judge sends them to prison. So you okay. go from jail to prison. It's just a, okay. uh, a graduate level. <laughs> type of okay. Thing. Okay. And there's, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, um, you know, the war on drugs, I guess in the eighties, that's when that started. The, the U S uh, prison uh -huh. population is, uh, one of, is the largest by far in the world. Correct. The U S you know, prison system. Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, okay. What is your largest prison system, largest inca incarceration, incarceration rates uh, per capita? You any any way you spin it, it's the largest. It's the largest by far, right? I mean, over every any country absolutely. out there, China, Russia, anything, yes, you know, absolutely. Venezuela, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Okay. What are your thoughts on that? And tell me your opinion. You know, of the uh, this quote unquote war on drugs, which we know is we're not winning, but I want to hear your firsthand experience with that. Yeah. No. No problem. Um, uh, first of all, I've seen many guys. Well, let, let me address the issue of mandatory minimums. Okay, they're terrible, and and they've and they've destroyed lives. Um, I by no means condone drug use, alcohol abuse, and and, and that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to be a hypocrite and sit up here and say that you're some kind of bad guy if you're a drug addict or if you're an alcoholic. I mean, you're sick with a disease, and and so, um, for instance, Ray, take my state that I live in now, the state of Idaho. Uh, if you get caught with a a drug possession charge, it's um, it's seven years right off the bat is, is a prison sentence. Now you don't have to do all those seven years, but that's what the standard sentence is. So you generally is any you'll drug, have to do any two, drug three, charge, four. Bo, any drug, uh, not marijuana, but methamphetamine, any? cocaine, uh, things like that. I have a Iraq veteran buddy who is a Fallujah Marine who is currently doing 14 years straight right now for three different heroin possession charges. And I, like I said, I, I don't condone any of this stuff, but he had a horrible, horrific time and had some DUIs and turned to drugs and, and, and this and that. And the judge finally, um, you know, he, he had been to prison for a couple of years before, kind of a slap on the wrist. And the last time uh, the judge gave him 20 years with 14 mandatory. Cool. So, I mean, and, and, and it's just, it's devastating. And the guy served his country. He was a Marine, I mean, a Fallujah Marine and, 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 uh, you know, a combat veteran, I don't want to say his name on here, you know, I, you know, violate his privacy or anything, but it's just heartbreaking. Right. And um, there's other, there's other avenues to exhaust rehabs, drug courts, veterans courts, alternative sentencing. Um, when those don't work and somebody continues to be uh, somebody who's a harm to society, then sure the prison or the penitentiary is, is an apt judgment or an apt conclusion to it. Absolutely. Because, you know, you, there comes a point in time where you have to understand its personal responsibility as well and to look out for the safety of the public. But just to um, automatically look at guys like they're pieces of meat and they're worthless because they, they have a drug addiction or, or they're an alcoholic and to throw them away and throw away the keys um, is just asinine. And it's called warehousing inmates. And it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with money. Um, because the states get money is the more inmates that that they can push through the system, the more inmates do the the prison programming, like the, the rehab programming and, and this and that. So the more heads that go through, it's like sending cattle through the more cattle heads you, you get through the more money the state gets from the federal government. And it's a never ending thing. So instead of um, emphasis on 
rehabilitation, uh, you know, recovery, things like that. It's just emphasis on uh, you're a drug addict or you're an alcoholic or you've made poor decisions. You're going away for a long time. And I understand. I'm, I'm not a, a real, I'm not a super bleeding heart guy. You know, I understand the needs for, for correction in, in prisons and, and penitentiaries, but I, I don't agree at all with this war on drugs, the mandatory minimum sentences, uh, sending guys away for extremely long periods of time. I'm talking 15, 20, 25 years for drug charges, Ray. Uh, on, you know, for, you know, stuff like the mandatory uh, manufacturing or, or, or selling. Um, I mean, there's so many socioeconomic issues that are underlying to a lot of these situations that these guys have, that this is what they turn to. And uh, punishment, yes, um, I'm for it. It helped me. 20 year punishment, are you kidding me? Absolutely not. You know, that destroys families, it, it divorces children. Um, it, it just, it rips away the very fabric of what this country is about and, and just creates dysfunctional, you know, sing, single parent households and, 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 you know, and nothing, and nothing against any single parent, you know, it just, it's just tough, you know, and, and um, I think there's other ways to deal with the problems that we have than, than uh, what's been going on since the 80s. And it's not just a Republican Democrat thing. If you look back and see throughout the last few decades, it's both sides have been equally, uh, equally involved in it. Is there any signs for improvement on this? Or is it just the same that it's been and there's no there's no way out of this. It's just going to continue harshness and no mercy in 15, 20 years in prison. Is there any anything on the horizon that shows that this, that this is going to improve a little bit? Or absolutely, yeah, yeah. There this is. is actually okay. kind of an kind of an exciting time the last oh, couple okay. years. Um, okay, okay. Um, uh, for a couple of reasons, um, I think the stigma of someone being an alcoholic or a drug addict has softened a little bit. Okay. Um, I think that it's been. The more, you know, even folks, regular guys like me, or even, you know, anybody, athletes, um, celebrities, regular Joes can get their stories out and, and, and people can understand that it can, this is not a race thing. This is not a, uh, an economic thing. This is, this is not a black, white thing. This is a, it can happen to anybody, doctor, lawyer, um, you know, guy living under the bridge, it, it ha addiction, alcoholism has no face to it. And so if, when people realize that it can happen to them and, it, and it's more of a medical issue, then I think the, the stigmas are, are softened a little bit as far as, um, so that part about the community maybe accepting or giving second chances or being not as judgmental to folks who have um, made some mistakes in their past is nice. But to, I think to address what you're really asking me, um, and again, I I'm, I'm, I'm never advocate for either side of the political spectrum or whatever, but I think one of the things that the last administration did that will be a lasting legacy in this country is the First Step Act. And to let men and women out of federal prison who have, are doing 20, 25 year sentences for three time marijuana convictions or whatever the heck it is, it's just amazing. Um, first of all, the, the sentences that were handed out, these mandatory minimums, as I've addressed earlier, have destroyed people and destroyed families and destroyed the fabric of, of everything about this country and, and you know, our, our family, our, the American family. But um, to start to let these, these nonviolent offenders out and, and, and folks that don't deserve to do 20 years for selling some pot on the street corner is just amazing. And if we can continue that, um, it sets a great precedence that a the war on drugs has not worked. What throwing away people and locking up the key is not the answer. Uh, B com compassion is the answer, uh, and and C you know re rehabilitatory type of um, uh, type of actions is, is what we need. And uh, I think it's amazing that we're starting to let people out, man. And uh, and I'm not talking about ultra violent people or or you know, people with bad crimes or sex offenders and things like that. You know, I'm, I'm talking about regular guys that have made some mistakes, man. You wouldn't believe some of the great guys that I've met in my time in, time in the penitentiary that have just made some poor mistakes, you know, and, and deserve another chance. And it's, and it's every, every facet of society, right? Doctors, lawyers, business guys, guys that work in warehouses. I mean, is it, it, it's across the Everybody. board right? that has this issue. Across the board. Yeah, is across it, is, the board. I've walked the rec yard many times. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Is it is it fair? I mean, if you have money, I mean, do, do they go to jail just as someone that is, you know, maybe more of a blue collar guy or maybe that doesn't have the wherewithal or, you know, 
Like, what's the story with that as far as I think, fairness goes? Uh, I think I think there's some um, some of that rooted in, in our justice system. I think anybody okay. with money has access to, you know, better representation, um, easier to bond out, things like that. But, um, you know, I was given a lot of chances as well, Ray. And, and I was given chances because I was a veteran. Um, you know, the judge would say, well, thank you for your service to your country. And we realize you've had kind of a kind of a tough go of it, you know, and um, so we're going to give you a few chances, but eventually the the chances run out, and, okay. and, and you're you're off to you're off to prison. Um, but yeah, there's some of that. There's there's a there's definitely a discrepancy between, um, I guess, a- economic ups or downs, or what what you have and you know at your disposal as far as represent you know attorneys, lawyers, uh, things like that, blue collar versus street collar type stuff. Yeah, there is, uh-huh. and it's unfair, but it is what it is for now. Right. Right. Okay. Tell us, Bo, about about prison. You know, you know, and don't you don't have to elaborate too long. But what's it like in there? I mean, I, I'm hearing yeah. it, you know it's boring. You know, uh, time goes slow. You're doing the hard time. Just tell us, <laughs> like, you know, in, in 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 your own words, like what what prison is like. Well, it's just there's different security levels for one. You know, there's generally a minimum, medium, and maximum. Um, and as you can imagine, as you go up the ladder, the, the more hardcore the criminal is and uh, the more hardcore the institutions are, um, you know, and I've been in pretty much all of them, you know, from the low to the high. And uh, I've probably done six years total in, in the penitentiary and, and a couple more in jail just waiting to go. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's about respect. If you give people respect, you're going to get respect. And uh, if you try to go in there mouthy and and uh, thinking you're this and that, then you're going to have problems, serious issues. And so it's uh, the first time you roll up to the prison gates from the county and get out the county van or the county bus, and you see the guard towers and all the barbed wire and uh, the big walls, uh, it, it, it hits home quick. You realize that this is not a, not a game. And right. then you tack, tack on to that, that you're not going home for years. Um, you better figure things out real quick or, or you can be in some trouble. Cause there are predators out there and, and everything is, you know, race run and, and, and gang run. And, and, and a lot of the guards are on the take and it's just a, a whole different life. And it's not real life. It's prison life. It doesn't apply to out here. Thank God, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, right. But, you know, uh, I actually turned my life around the last time I was in, in prison and, uh, and I got a couple of years into my, my sentence, I had a year or two left to do. And, and I got sent upstate to a um, more of a, a minimum medium security facility. Um, so instead of having, I think, 2,500 inmates just full of gang members and, and all this stuff where I was, I got sent up to a nice place where I could kind of get myself together. I started going to AA meetings. I started coaching softball, um, played a little shortstop, <laughs> you know, okay. it was fun. And uh, yeah, and met some guys, you know, uh, that, are, that are good athletes and guys that could have, you know, got couple minor league ball players in there, you know, um, the, back in the past, D1 guys, D1 talent guys, a lot of them, you know, and just made some bad decisions. Does it um, get to the point? So where there's a little, there's a little, where you get used to it after like you're in there for a few years, you got six more months to go. And then you just sort of like, you know, it's like not okay, but you're like, all right, you know, I could deal with this. I'm going to be out in yeah, four more yeah. months. I mean, is that kind of come into your mindset? Well, yeah, absolutely. So, um, there's a, there's a thing called learning how to do time. Okay. And a lot of guys don't know how to do time. And so okay. <clears throat> they do it between their ears. And if you do your time between your ears, you're, you're done. All you're going to do is sit around and just worry yourself to death. So there comes a point in time where uh, you can make a little life for yourself in prison. You can order a little TV, you know, a little 12 inch commissary TV, <laughs> you know, and a few things and try to make your life as comfortable as possible. It's not comfortable. Come to the realization that, okay, well, I'm not going home until X amount of time. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, hard time it as they call it. I'm not going to think about it on a daily basis. And, and I'm just going to sit back and uh, I don't want to say enjoy it because there's something joyful about it or enjoyable right. about it, but right. I'm going to come to come to grips. And for me, the last time it gave me a lot of time to think of, uh, uh, what I've done in the past, how I want to change it and where I want to go. And uh, there's a lot of time to sit around when you're in a 12 by eight, you know, or even in a dorm or guys or whatever, you know, and, and or just have a you and your celly. Um, and there's just a lot of downtime to think about things. Mainly you miss your family so much and you miss your children. I miss my children, my family. Um, 
you know, I, I, there's, there's a lot of the stuff that you see also, there's, there's a ton of violence and a ton of, you're always on a heightened sense of, you know, which really takes a toll on you, you know, but the survival um, mode, you're always in that survival what it is. mode. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you know, it just, it is what it is, man. And, 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 uh, you get with the program or the program gets you. Okay. Okay. So now you leave yeah. prison forever. Well, I'm, I'm hoping forever. Right. Yes, sir. You're, you're, Absolutely. That's it for that's it for that chapter. When do you become? Was it in Done. was it in prison when you become? I'll call it sober or free of the drugs and alcohol. Or when does that happen? It was in prison. It was in prison. It was. And uh, okay. I've continued it since I've been out. Yeah, yeah. I just okay. I made a decision to turn my life around. Um, we talked about the spiritual aspect of things uh, a little while ago, you and I on this. Uh -huh. And uh, I just said I can't I can't do this anymore. Um, so I started going to AA meetings in prison. Um, okay. I was familiar with AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, there are other ways to get sober. This is my preferred way, the 12-step programs. I, I really enjoy it. Is that good for anybody to go to both? Guys. Like AA, even like yeah. someone that's not alcoholic? Because it seems like it's a great thing. Why not other people go to it? You don't have to be alcoholic, correct? No, I mean, there's certain, okay. there, well, uh, some some meetings are called closed meetings where they you have to have a desire to stop drinking. Um, okay. But a lot okay. of meetings are open meetings and they're like uh, college students doing dissertations on, you know, or will show up and listen. Um, some folks who just want to are intrigued by it. And it is a, to me, what I tell people, it's a template for living for me today. And it's worked for me and it works on a daily basis. And, and basically Ray, um, not to go through all the 12 steps on your show here, but it comes down to um, just realizing that uh, I can't do this on my own, turning my, my will and life to a, over to a power greater than myself. And then kind of uh, purging myself, the things I've done, making amends to others for the things that I've done to them asking for forgiveness and then uh, giving away so freely to others or giving away to others that is what's been so freely given to me. And that's how I stay sober. And, and I, and I, and nothing, like I said, makes me happier than to help other, other people struggling that have no hope and to see the light come on their eyes and be like, man, I got this. This is amazing. This life, I can do this. I don't have to have guns to my head or live, live under a bridge or, or think so terribly of myself or be so scared of my own shadow. You know, I can walk with my shoulders high and, and I can get a good job and I can get my driver's license back and I can be a respected member of society and, 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 and things like that, which are really a lot of people take for granted, but a lot of people don't have these things, you know, and a lot of people live in homeless shelters and under bridges. And, and I know I've said that, you know, but it's, it's just amazing what this program's done for me, my belief in, in my spirituality and, and, and my higher power, but it's even more amazing to me to see some of the people that I've seen turn their life around as well. Um, rich people, poor people, middle class people, black people, white people, you name it. And it's just, it's the greatest thing to me that's ever happened to me. Is it true, Bo, the, the old adage, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger? I mean, I would imagine you wish you didn't go through all this, but you wouldn't be here at this minute if you didn't go through it. I mean, is there, you know, is there truth to that? I mean, I, a, I don't want to go of... through it, but, you know. I no, mean, no, you're, you're fine. You're side. fine. Um, uh, two different takes on that. Um, I'm actually happy that I went through it now that okay. I look back on it. And, and it sounds silly because it's, you know, like I said, there's been some, t some terrible stuff that I, that I went through and, and I don't want to like say, make myself sound like a victim. I, you know, I did a lot of things and just life was life, you know? Um, but I believe that life today, I, I, I like who I am. I'm, I'm confident in who I am. Um, I'm confident in the things that I do. I'm, I'm confident in my abilities and I'm confident in my ability to stay sober on a daily basis and have a, have a, a good, solid, you know, happy life moving forward. I have skills today that I've learned through this program that I never in a million years would have learned if I had not have gone through what I've gone through. Um, empathy, compassion, um, I could go on and on. Um, so, you know, uh, nobody wants to go through that kind of stuff, but it's, it's almost like, uh, I want to make the best out of the situation. And, and, uh, you know, I look, I used to be a glass half empty guy my entire life, man. And I'm a complete glass half full guy now completely. Um, I, I feel like I'm on house money and I just love life because I'm doing the things daily that I need to do though. I can't just sit on my hands and say, you know, God help me and not do anything. I, I have right. to be active in my recovery, but it's a great life. Yes. What advice, Bo? By the way, you got a great name. If you would have become a, a, an MLB player, I mean, the majors, uh, Bo <laughs> Payne is a great name, you know? I mean, 
pitching. That would have been a good pain. one, wouldn't yeah, it? That, that's a good one. You got a good name for you know yeah. a baseball name. Um, yeah. Say there's a young Bo Payne, um, 12 years old, going through what you were going through, and 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 you could be like an angel on on the kid and like you know try to guide him. Is there anything you could say to him, or do you have to kind of go through it, or what advice would you give a young kid, or say a 15 year old kid that could decipher the advice? What what would you say? I. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, no, you don't have to go through it. Absolutely not. And I would never want anybody to go through that. Uh, my experiences are my own um, experiences to myself. And so I, I just speak from my experiences, how they have helped me. But no child should have to go through any of that, uh, for one. Um, I would definitely tell them to to talk to somebody and, and talk to a teacher, a, a, a trusted a coach, somebody, and say, hey, please help me. You know, because I think that a lot of a lot of kids are scared to ask for help. For one, I certainly was. You know, I felt like I was out on an island by myself, and I thought I, I just if I if I spoke up and if I said something, I thought well, I was always told if I said something, I would get it worse. So a complicated situation in my my life. But um, and then I would you know I would just tell kids to just keep going, you know, and do the best you can. Don't have expectations as compared to your buddy down the street is, you know, looks great, has a nice car that, you know, you know, just be yourself and try to be happy with who you are. And, and I know that is tough, man. Being in high school is tough. We want girls to notice us and we want to be the, the best athletes and, and we're coming into our own and we're insecure and we have all these different things. Um, but it gets better. It gets better. Uh, it certainly got better for me. Um, you know, I like working with a lot of adults to my age or even younger adults um, who have absolutely been through it and have no hope at all in their life. And I like to tell them that uh, there's miracles out there. And, uh, and I like to share my story with folks and, and, and tell them that you can be that miracle too. And, and you are so loved by so many people. And it just don't give up. It's, you know, I, I, I've listened to Valvano's speech, you know, a thousand times in my life and it never gets old. And I hate to trade on his name. You know, I, I never knew him, never met him. You know, as a young child, I remember Wittenberg in 83 and all that stuff. But uh, his speech is amazing for somebody dying like that and to have the strength and courage like a Stuart Scott, you know, to, to stand up there and say, don't give up. Just just don't give up when you know that you're dying. You know, it's just beyond it just blows my mind the courage that some people have in the humans and how, and how strong the human spirit is. And uh, I'm, I think that I'm testament to, to what can happen if I, if, if, if folks just don't give up, you know, and that sign behind you by John Lennon, you may say I'm a dreamer. You know, I dreamt a lot and I, and I had a lot of dreams as a kid, but I never thought they would come true because I was just so lost. And uh, as I started to do things in my older years, uh, to make myself better, the dreams came back to me, and and now I I, I dream every day, but I but they're attainable, man, and uh, and and I'm making them, and I'm making it happen. And if you're down and out, and you think that you're done, and you're thinking about ending it, or you're you're just thinking that this addiction or alcoholism will never end, my friend, I am telling you that there are miracles in this world, and I see them every single day. So just don't give up. Yeah. If you if you saw your 12 year old kid, no one. Now, this is this is a spontaneous question. And then I want to jump ahead about life yeah. right now. All right. Yeah, you, have at it. Yeah, you right, bet. Man. Ready for this? All right. Uh, you go to your 12 year old. Uh, no, knowing what you're going to go through. I mean, Bo, you're 12. This is all going to happen to you. But this is what I want to say to you. What do you say to yourself at 12? No one. That's all. You're not going to change any of it, but you're just going to you're just going to tell them something give them some advice or just about what lies ahead or, you know, what do you say to yourself at 12? Like myself looking back. Yeah. Kind of as now, Oh man, I would just, well, I mean, there's a few things that I would want, not want him to do, <laughs> but uh, I would just say, love yourself and you're going to be okay. And, uh, and honestly, like the cliches, like you said, you know, you're going to be strong and you're going to come out of this stronger than you ever in your, in your life imagined that you could be. Um, and I'd say, son, just, it's going to be okay. And uh, you're going to help the world someday. And it's going to be a great mm -hmm. thing. And wow. uh, you're going to look back on this and smile and, and, uh, and, and you're going to, you're going to make magic. 
Hmm. Let me hear the next three years what, what your goals are, Bo. And, you know, you're going to get your degrees. You're going to uh, school now. Like, like, you know, I mean, can you think that far ahead after what you've been through? Or are you day to day? Or is it hour to hour? Or can you think a year or two ahead? Like, what's your dream? Yeah, I've got long term goals. Um, and I can meet those long term goals as long as I do daily things, you know, and uh, I work a daily program of recovery and that gives me a life. Um, and so my life, what I want to do in two or three years, obviously, I want to be graduate. I want to get my degree. I should have that in about a year or so if I work hard through it. Um, and then I want to get back into uh, sports, man. I want to work in the, in somebody's organization or maybe be an agent or rep represent athletes. Uh, my degree is going to be in sports management. So um, I know a lot of guys, I think. Uh, I've got a fantastic friend here in Boise. I want to say his name is uh, Buffalo guy, New York guy. Okay. Uh, his name is Vince Zappi. Uh, he's an old boss of mine. Just a fantastic. You'd love him, Ray. He's a huge Yankee fan. He okay. and I go at it <laughs> on right. a regular That's day good. basis That's over yeah. Sox Yanks. But okay. but uh, and, and he's worked with a lot of athletes in the past, and and uh, he's a fantastic guy. He's a saint, one of my best friends around here. And uh, you know, he said, "Hey, man, I'll put you in touch with people." And so my goal is to obviously number one in my life is to stay sober. Number two in my life is to help other people get sober and stay sober. And, and number three is. Uh, you know, to, to have a good career and to be happy and, and, uh, and find a field where I can work in, you know, with, with my degree. So I've got a lot of good stuff ahead of me as long as I, I stay clean and sober on a daily basis, which I have no doubt in the world I will do if I do the things that I need to do. And the sky's the limit. Absolutely. It, is it still work? The to jail stay? cells and the prison cells. And That's only right? Is it, is it still work to stay sober? Ancient. I mean, every day is it work? Yeah, it's work. It's okay. work, but it's enjoyable okay. work. You okay. know, I mean, okay. life is work to anybody, sober, okay. non alcoholic, mm. non-alcoholic. It's mm -hmm. life is work, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel the fruits of, uh, you know, bearing the fruits of uh, the work that I put in makes my life so much more enjoy joyful anyways, you know, like, like we were talking, being in the program and being in AA for me, I've, I've learned so much about myself and I've learned to appreciate things so much more. And my, my gratitude for things is just off the charts, you know, little things. And so uh, it's work, but it's uh, like I said, we all put in work. You put in yeah, work. I put right, in work. Right. Everybody puts in work, man. So yeah, I'm happy I'm, to do it too. I'm going to do a, a quick word association and we'll wrap it up. Is that good? First, first word or phrase. Okay. That yeah. You, okay. If you're in a foxhole, right? Hole, right? You're, in a, you're in a foxhole. Other than family members, uh, who would you have in the foxhole with you? Pedro Martinez. Oh, okay. Wow. Going right to the top. Nice. Going to the top. If you were, here, here's one. If you were on a deserted island and you had to bring two music CDs or albums or downloads with you, you're on this beautiful island for three years and you could bring... I'm going to say one. You could bring one piece of music with you. What would you bring? I'm bringing Zeppelin three. Okay. Wow. Well, and, or and maybe no hesitation. Fleet, maybe rumors. Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Zeppelin three or, or rumors. Fleetwood. Okay. You a Zeppelin fan? <clears throat> I love Zeppelin. Big Zeppelin fan. They had yeah. something going on, right? Tangerine. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you had to meet so one. Those are coming with me. <laughs> okay. One person in the world uh, tomorrow, Bo, alive or dead, I'm going to let you meet this person. Who, who would it be? Oh, Tom Brady. Okay. Okay. I know that sounds superficial, but, um, you know, well. Well, it's whoever you want. do that one, Ray. You okay. Know. Can I get a do-over? I'm going to let you meet this guy. I'm going to take Brady away, and who do you want to meet tomorrow? Yeah. Ah, uh, tomorrow, dead or alive, um. I'd love to meet, uh, I'd love to meet Ronald Reagan. Okay. Hmm. And pick his mind. L lunch with Reagan. Good and bad. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That would be pretty, yeah. pretty wild. Right. Okay. I like that. Yeah, I, like I think that. so. And who is the most famous person you ever met? I met Jordan. Okay. Michael Jordan. You, you, hello, uh, how are you? That kind of thing. Small story or? about him real quick. Yeah. Yeah. My sister and I, um, I was 12. She was eight. We were flying from O'Hare to Memphis. This is probably 86. The year he was hurt with his foot. I can't remember what year it was. 85, 86. And it was a late night flight. And, um, and, uh, 
he saw my sister and I just kind of gawking at him and on the on the flight and and we got off the flight and we're in Memphis in the terminal and I'm going to visit my grandmother and uh, all these people are clamored around him. You know, he's, he's MJ and he comes straight up to myself, little kids and starts talking to us and kind of rubbed my head, you know, and, and it was just awesome. You know, I've okay. met a lot of, a lot of guys, you know, Kareem and a lot of baseball, played with a lot of baseball players and stuff like that. But uh, I guess, you know, I'm going straight to the top on that one. All yeah, MJ. yeah, 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 yeah. He, he had some magic, right? He looked, he, there was something... I don't know. It was almost godlike with him, you know. Like I saw him in person play a few times just, up close. You know, it was something to see. You know, who was the most electric, impressive? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Who who was the most impressive person you ever met? You know, someone that really uh, you admired. Anyone? Anyone particular? Oh boy. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's been. Uh, I met the guy. Do you remember the movie Flight with Denzel Washington? No, it's about an, uh, a pilot. He's an well, um, it's a it's about an alcoholic pilot who loses his license, gets grounded. Um, it's with Denzel. The movie's called Flight. I met the real life guy, a uh, Native American fellow, at a uh, AA convention years ago, and he was just funny and humble and hilarious and confident and fantastic and had the greatest message I've ever heard. Um, had kind of movie star status to him. And uh, he just, he just was so impressive, you know, and he was 20 something years sober. And uh, he just knocked my socks off, man. And I just looked at that guy. I said, I want to be like that guy someday, you know, uh, confident, but just so willing to talk to anybody about anything, uh, always having the time to do for others, you know, not, 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 not big league in you for lack of a better right. word you know when i say right. big league and yeah i mean i don't have time for you you know right um and he's, he's a pretty impressive man so I, I you know ray i've met a lot of athletes and, and celebs but some of the most impressive people that i've ever met are are guys that are men and women who have turned their lives around uh from addiction and alcoholism and uh are kind of nameless i guess in in the grand scheme of things okay but the humility from these people um and the ability to give of themselves are uh, is just off the charts. So those are my heroes. Right. Second chance. That's what America is about, right? Isn't it? Isn't that what I always thought America was? About? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Bo, um, anything you'd like to add? This this was a great hour. Appreciate your time. This was unbelievable uh, having you on. Anything you want to mention or yeah. in closing? I'll yeah. give you the last words on on it. Yeah, you bet. Um, just th uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me on, Ray. I really appreciate it. You're it's welcome. been nice getting to know you. Um, and yes. I just want want to say uh, to any anybody out there that may my story uh, might resonate with them, or they may be able to draw some parallels. Young, old, in between, man, woman, black, white. That does not matter. There is hope out there. Don't lose hope. It gets better. Sometimes it, sometimes it seems like it'll never, ever change. But if you just keep trying, it will change. And believe in miracles because I've been as low as a human being can go in life. I've sank into depths that 99% of the people in this country would have no idea about. And I love my life today. And it can happen for you too. So just keep plugging away. And uh, I'll keep all of you in my prayers. And uh, you'll have a great life. And that's it. Great, great. Bo Payne, thank you for your time. Thank and, you, Ray. Uh, for your yeah. wisdom, for your wisdom. I am Ray Kay. Make it a great day, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of New HD NYC. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform.